Jesus to shed his blood or has he already shed his blood? Then why do sometimes we live as if it hasn't happened yet? That means his blood has already accomplished his work, right? So let me ask you another question. If it's already happened, has the blood of Jesus accomplished his work inside of you? If not, do you think you have more power than the blood of Jesus? You see, this is where we're going to be at today. We're focusing on miracles. A miracle is a supernatural act of God that man cannot do. Man cannot perform. So if you would, let's stand in in John chapter 4, looking at verse 46. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to receive this. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. Amen. You excited to be here? Say amen. Amen. Okay, y'all got the amens now. Now let's go. I believe the word of God. I I trust in God's promises. To mold me, to strengthen me, to encourage me, to save me, and to send me. Today I will listen. Today I will learn. The Bible says, John chapter 4, begin reading in verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Let's pray. Father God, we, we honor your word. This word is, is without error. It is supernatural. This word is a miracle from cover to cover, from the first word to the last word. Father God, there are miracles in our church. There's miracles in this room that has happened. And there's miracles in this room that has not happened yet. Father God, I pray today that you speak to that heart. They've always believed that you could do something. They just never repented so you could do something in them. Father God, we pray you come in power in this place and let us learn what it means to have faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said. I'm going to ask a question, and I think you have it in your worship guide. And, And be careful to answer this too quick. Can you experience a miracle from God and not have faith? Can you experience a miracle from God and not have faith? I want to ask you a question. How many of you have prayed for someone that you know is lost to be healed? How many of you have prayed for somebody that you know is not a Christian, but God might have brought them back to life? God might have cured their cancer. God might have done something amazing in their life. And some of those people you may have prayed for, they're not believers. They're still not believers, but God did something amazing in their life. That means God did a healing in their life, and they do not have faith. Here's something that we need to get as mankind. God is not tied to our thinking and our wisdom and our knowledge and our timetable. God can do anything he wants to, to anybody he wants to, anytime he wants to, anywhere he wants to. He can do anything at all times. We, the reason that we don't experience miracles today is because we don't believe in them. 
It's like we allow ourselves to rob this. God, God is so, His ways are higher than our ways. We can't even comprehend. And as, as we go through this, I want you to look in the Scripture with me. And if the Holy Spirit speaks to you something about this miracle that I don't say, I want you to circle that, and I want that to be a sign to you that that's what God spoke to you and not what the preacher spoke to you. Because He's going to speak to you through this toward your children, toward your families, toward your friends. And I want us to see the amazing miracle that happened right here. I love, I'm going to love doing these miracles because I'm learning so much. And what we're doing is we're taking these miracles. Why did Jesus perform that miracle back then? What was the purpose of it? What was the power behind it? And what does it bring to the table today that we can learn from it? You see, that's what we're going to learn in this scripture. So the first point is the place of the miracle. The place of the miracle, Jesus has now returned to the place where he performed his very first miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. Now remember, and when you're thinking about this miracle, this wine, you remember they had wine at the beginning and they run out. He commanded these guys, you go fill up these water pots. He filled them to the brim. When they filled them to the brim, then Jesus turned the water into wine. I want to tell you something about that wine. It was new wine. It wasn't fermented. It wasn't alcohol. It was new wine. This new wine had not been trampled on by the feet of man. It had not been squeezed for man to produce it and make it himself. It was something that only God could give. When you sit in this service today and you have your salvation, God did not give you old wine and old wine skins. He gave you new wine, and that's the only place new wine can exist is in a new wine skin. You know, I've searched that scripture, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I've said, God, what is the truth behind that, that you can't put new wine in the old wine skins? And I've, I've wondered that, and up until this very moment, standing in this pulpit right now, God just spoke to me and showed me that that's just about genuine salvation, that you become a new creation in Christ. Is that not a miracle? Now, I want to show you some things. The, 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 the return of Jesus. Jesus returns to the place where his first miracle, and the word was already spreading. There's so much to learn from the way these miracles begin and happen. Why do you say that? Look in chapter 4 of John, verse 39. Look at verse 39. I want to show you something. If you believe this morning that God is working in your life, doing things that you don't even know about yet, say amen. amen. Now watch this. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. That is one of my favorite sayings in the Bible. He told me all I ever did, and he loved me and gave me eternal life anyway. Isn't that amazing? And, 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 and what happened was he knew. Remember the first miracle? He said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My time has not yet come. To me, when I think about that, he's thinking, listen, I set up in Genesis chapter 26 a divine appointment with the woman at the well. That, that's, now, God's sovereign. He, he knows all things. I'm not saying, but I'm just trying to show you the, how God respects your responsibility and divine order. You have a responsibility when you pray to receive Jesus Christ to live out the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You have a, and when you don't do that, it means that you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life. When you continue to live out, does that mean you can lose your salvation? If you can lose your salvation, that means you can work for it. You can't do anything to save yourself. You, the blood of Jesus has already been shed for you. Calvary has already happened. The nails have already been driven. The cross has already been taken down. Everything has happened and been put into place. Either you have faith in that miracle or you do not. Now, thinking that way is important right now as we go through this because there is a deceit today. I see it all the time. Adam gets up here with a green card and he'll say, I just want to welcome you and thank you for being our guest. And every time he says that, this is what I think. I know people that's been a guest in church for 30 years in the same church. They've never become a child of God. They've always been a guest. And, and those of you in the room has been in church very long, and you have truly been born again and redeemed, 
you know that God does not honor gypsy mentality in church. He says you need to plant, you need to bloom where you're planted. I'm going to ask you something this morning. Where has God planted you? Because you see, that's a divine appointment. God, God this, this whole city was saved because God planted a seed with this woman, this harlot, this piece of trash. Now everybody looked at her, and she looked at herself that way. That's the reason she went to the wet, to the well when she did. She did not, she shame on her. Well, shame on us. We do the same thing. We think we're a piece of trash. We think we're a mistake. We think, well, there's no way God could ever do in me what he does in friend. That's a lie. That's not true. When God saves you, you're a miracle of God. Miracles are not defined by what your past did. Miracles are defined by what God did. Woo! Huh? Man, now watch this. First, he kept a divine appointment with the woman at the well. And now Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry. You know, do you think he knew about the divine encounters that was coming? That's not the question I want to ask you this morning. Do you think he still does? He does, don't he? You see, when, we, when you live, we don't get burdened down with church work. Don't get burdened. I'm talking to the people in this room you serve. And people in this room, and you serve, you serve too much, and you get so caught up, you, you lose your joy in serving. Because you've made it all about you. How you feel, how you think. Say, Brother Joey, how do you know that? Because I had to pray this morning before I came out to preach. God, would you, I, I, I repent, I, I want my negative thoughts that I have. How could a pastor in a church that's experienced what we have for seven years have a negative thought? I mean, that's a pitiful person, is it not? You see, how does that happen? How does it happen? We just begin to dwell on things that are about us. Now, come on now. We've got to be truthful. I'm, being tr- I'm laying myself out in front of y'all. Y'all at least have the integrity to be, to be truthful about yourself. Okay? So what we do is we allow ourselves to think. And, and the things that we're negative about are things that don't match our opinions. And doesn't match how we feel. And doesn't match this. Or doesn't match our timetable. God is not here to honor our timetable. We are here to honor His. You see, that, that's where He is. That's why he sh- the, the place of this miracle is important. Our young people today, I watch young people come to church anywhere from the age of 8 to 13 years old, and I can watch a young person in the service for 30 minutes, and I can tell you what kind of home life they have. I can tell you when they have no respect. I can tell you when they have no honor. I can tell you when they, they are captivated by sin and don't have no use for Jesus. Why? Because if Jesus can't change my mama's life, why should I bother? Huh? Our children are confused today because we claim to be born-again, blood-bought believers. And we're telling our children this is what a Christian looks like. And our children are watching us continue to do this and to do this and to do this. And finally our children say, I ain't having no part. That's just a bunch of hypocrisy. There's no life in that. But you show me a family like I seen this morning. The miracle that we're reading about in the Bible we experienced in our church this morning. We've seen it. I've seen the most prideful man I have ever met since I've been at Union 3 Baptist Church come down the aisle and shed tears on my shoulder. Now, what if you got in the way with your opinion and your thoughts and how you feel right now? What if you quit? What if you let up? What if October 22nd, 1995, when we came to Mount Zion that day, with not coming to get saved, just coming because we knew that was our only hope? What if the church would have been fighting? And what if the worship hadn't have been on target? What if the revivalist hadn't had God's message? Do you see how important it is for us today as a culture, for us to put the culture that God wants us to have in the church? We need a culture of miracles in our church. We don't need a culture of man-made thoughts and minds. We need to have a culture of miracles. God can save any marriage that's in our community. God can save any man, woman, and child anywhere in the world. God God can heal any heart. It doesn't matter how dark you are. It doesn't matter how dark the sin in your past. God can totally free you and and heal you completely, completely. Do you believe that? Say amen. Amen. Now, 
the attacks had already begun. Uh, people began to attack him, and it took a lot of courage. This nobleman, that meant royal officer. That means it took a lot of courage. His town where he was from, there was probably a military base there. And for him to come, and, and why did he come? Did he have faith in Jesus? No, he did not. Did he believe Jesus is the Messiah? No, he did not. But he knew that the doctors couldn't heal his son. He knew that the Romans couldn't heal his son. And the only hope he had was Jesus. Friend, you can come in this building and you think the only hope you got is Jesus and not have faith in him. You see, you can believe in all those things but not trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can know that there's a mighty God. Even the demons, James 2.19, believes there's a God and they tremble. You see, we can know that. We can know, I know i got to be in church. I know I need to love the hymns. I know I need to love the worship. I know I need to love the Word of God. And you, how many of us walk around all week long holding this Word and have not hid thine word in thine heart that I might not sin against thee? It's all the same thing, the attitude that the nobleman has here. You investigate your life. I've had people come to me after the first service, and they said, you're, you're, the message God gave you took my breath away. I was under such intense testing of my faith in the midst of that service. I had to really ask God, God, am I, is my heart right with you? You know, shouldn't every message be like that when we open up the pages of the Word of God? So watch this. We're going to go a little deeper. In John 4, verse 44, it says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. What does that mean? That means if you get a little upset, if you don't get your opinion, you don't get your way, the pastor starts pouting because he don't feel just right or something's wrong, eventually Jesus has to dust his feet off and go somewhere else. You see, guys, we're not here to pay respects to Joey, and we're not here to pay respects to Barry. We're not here to pay respects to man. We're here this morning to pay respects to God. Because he is the one who has done everything that we need. I'm going to tell you something. Y'all may be a small crowd, but I'm getting more amens in this group than we did in the whole building full over there. And I love y'all. Thank you so much, because this is going to get good. Now, when God does a good work, there will always be people the enemy uses to attack it. How could somebody say something negative about the blind man who was blind all of his life and he received his sight? Who was the people that said something negative about it? The church folk. They sure did. You know why? Because it didn't happen to them. Miracles, listen, I'm going to give you some great advice here, and this is coming from just experiencing it myself. It's always a red flag spiritually in your life if you become jealous of God doing an amazing miracle in somebody else's life. That ought to be the greatest celebration that you have. Don't allow yourself to be jealous of God working in somebody else's life. You need to celebrate that. What that's saying is, is that you are not where you're supposed to be. It's showing that something's wrong. You know what? I, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on. The reason of the nobleman... <laughs> the reason of the nobleman, the nobleman was in Capernaum. And he came and he begged. He was there to beg Jesus. Jesus, my son's going to die. You're my only hope. You're my only hope. I've seen people and I see you. I've, seen, I've watched people come to church. You're my only hope. You're my only hope. They come and they pray. They go right back home and they do this very same thing that they did. Their lives didn't change. Nothing changed. They come so God could change their life. They didn't come so God could change their heart. You see, that's, that's not salvation. Why did you come here today? Are you here because you worship who Jesus is? Or are you here because you worship what he can do? This is the difference between what... The, this is where our focus needs to be. Jesus does not have to do anything else for us. Everything, all the blessings and the promise comes from receiving and trusting the blood of, that's been shed for me. This noble man didn't know Jesus. He just knew the man from Galilee. He just knew that he healed and did this at the water to wine. He heard by this on his way, he probably heard about the woman at the well. By the time the city got to talking, saying, man, told me all I ever did. And now another divine appointment. He just thinks if he can do it for the woman, if he can do it for the wedding, he can do it for my son. He can do it for my son. Listen, any parent out here, you would do that. But that doesn't mean you're saved. Now watch this. The, the, the nobleman, desperate people will ask for God. 
even when they have no faith at all in God. That is another reason that God performing a miracle for this man's son did not mean that this family was saved. And as a matter of fact, according to Scripture, we see that this family was lost. They were not saved. Watch this. Not only the place of the miracle, but the people of the miracle. You know, here's the problem. The heart of the matter. Why you come to Jesus has a lot to do with your results. When, you come, when, you, when, you, when you're going to be saved, when God is saving us, I know He breaks us. First thing, the, con, the Holy Spirit is going to convict you of sin in your life. That you, that, that, that you need to get your heart right. You're separated from God. And, 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 and listen, if the Holy Spirit keeps convicting you about that, and you're claiming that you repented of that, either God's a liar or you are. You see, that's not the way that works. When God, you, That stops when you're truly saved. It quits. You stop second guessing. You stop wondering. The body of Christ becomes a place that it's not easy, but it's not something you want to give up. I, I can't afford to not be there. These people at this time, the nobleman's son, he was sick. You see the son, he, he was sick and he was going to die. The family is already mourning the, the, the things that's happened. This nobleman leaves his son's side. Now you think about this. His son is at the place of death and he, he is focused so much on his last hope that he takes a journey 20 miles and leaves his son knowing his son could die in the midst of him going to find Jesus. There is something amazing that's happened here that happens in each and every one of our lives when we have surrendered. When we look back at our journey, there is things that was put into place. People prayed for us when we were lost. People was praying for us when we were sick spiritually. And, and, and they kept doing that. And, I, and, and, and listen, that's why your salvation, you have to realize, you didn't do anything to save yourself. You, you was actually prayed, you might have been prayed to the altar. You might have been prayed to visit this church this morning. But I'm telling you, that's the, it shows the power of prayer. This dad loved his son. Now watch this. The nobleman's son was sick, and sickness is a great problem. God has the power to give life today. If you believe it, say amen. amen. He can give you physical life, and he can give you eternal life. But there's a difference. The only reason that I believe God extends the days of a lost person is so they have an opportunity to worship Him. Now watch this. The nobleman was seeking a miracle for his son, but not a Savior for his soul. He was consumed by his love for his son. <laughs> Church, that's why you're sitting here. We have a father that was consumed his love for the world and his love for his son. He wrapped himself in flesh because he knew that all the struggles and all the stress and all the things that we were going to set in this building, he did not want anything to rob us from experiencing the miracles and the blessings of God. Now, how many things in this world, in your past, have you allowed rob you of blessings and rob you of miracles? Think about that. God didn't do that. You did that. Your family didn't do that to you. You have no power praying as a victim. You can't. You've got to pray in victory or you don't pray at all. You pray in victory. The blood of Jesus has already been shed. Now remember, we've covered that. The work of the cross has already been set in motion. And it is not failing. The cross did not fail. It didn't miss anybody and it didn't leave anybody out. Okay? Now watch this. I keep saying watch this a lot, don't I? Okay, I'm going to correct this. Watch this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is a, oh yeah, I love it. It's habit. Many were coming to Jesus because of what he could do and not because of who he was. This man possibly came to Jesus because of what he had done and not because of who he was. This is what he refers to when you look in verse 48. And he says, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs. You know, there's a lot of you people around. You people. What is he talking about? You people was people who did not trust in him to be who he is. He was placed in a manger. He was God. He did many miracles. He was God. He healed people that 
Most people, the demon, I mean, let's just think about this. Did the man, the demon, the man possessed by demons, a legion of demons, did he get healed because he had faith? This thing of signs and wonders that we have in our churches today is ridiculous. Because we will watch somebody and, and they'll say, well, this guy, he was, he, he, was, you know, he was in a wheelchair and he stands up and walks. When did he pray and receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior? When did he repent of his sin? When did his new creation begin? When did that happen? I love the miracle. I would have loved to have seen the blind man when he seen colors for the first time. But I would have loved to have seen the blind man when he seen Jesus the first time. Now watch. I left out this. I'm sorry. This man... We still have the people today that's fascinated with, with, by signs and wonders. They're more fascinated by signs and wonders than they are Calvary. Signs and wonders can't save you, but Calvary already has. Amen. Where are you this morning? Are you here to worship God for who He is or what He can do? The point, signs and wonders can't save you. Only trust in Jesus Christ can save your soul. Asking for signs and wonders is a sign of unbelief. It's not a sign of faith. All through the scriptures when people, that's why Jesus says this in this text. When you, Jesus doesn't have to do anything else for me. I want him to. Man, I, if you want to see Jesus walk on water, raise your hand. I do. And I want to walk right beside him. Man, I'm telling you, that's awesome. You imagine that? I mean, I struggle to swim. Much less walk on water. And I, I, I mean, I would love to see something like that. But shame on me if I would rather see something like that than what I got to see this morning. I will never forget it. Because you watch people pray. You watch people serve. You watch, I've seen so many families, and I look through our church and see so many people. I watch people, you're sitting back and you're waiting on God to do something. He already did. Only thing that's keeping you from being saved is you. It's just you. He's already done it. He's already said it. He's already painted the pictures. He's already done everything. Everything's in motion. If you understand that you need to be saved and you're not, you may not ever get saved. You may be one of those people that you just don't have faith. You have faith to believe there's a God. You just don't have the faith to repent of that God. You see, that's the greatest miracle. God can bring you back to life. He can restore your health. You, you can give credit to God and still not be what you're supposed to do. He, he shows us that you can even you have the right motivation. You can do all these things and just totally miss God in the body. You can be a member of a church. There are so many members of Baptist churches that are not in the roles of heaven. They're not. They're claiming their membership and their, and their classes and all this, but they don't never serve God and worship Him the way He's supposed to. This is my church. You ain't changing my church. Praise God, you better let somebody change your church. God needs to change this church. We can't keep doing things the same way like we have the past seven years. Why? Why? We have a no, whole new group of generation coming in. And God's, Paul says, be all things to all people. we got to figure out a way, a creative way to get this powerful message. Don't water down the message, brother. But you got to have a creative way to go build relationships with people you don't have nothing in common with. And you got to share your testimony with them that they realize where the God brought you from. And then you got to, then the Holy Spirit's going to create a desire in them for God to bring them out just like He did you. But then we got to model. We have to model sanctification and we have to model holiness in our life. It doesn't mean we're perfect. There's nobody in this room, including your pastor, that's perfect. My goal is not to be perfect, my goal is to be obedient. That's it. And when I'm obedient, God's going to work in my life. So the people here, you have the nobleman, and you have his son, and you have Jesus. And right here, there's this makeup that, that's something powerful. And the last thing is the power of the miracle. And this is where it gets good. I mean, it's all good. Don't get me wrong. But in verse 49, the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. 
This guy had no hope. This is the power of compassion. Why did Jesus Jesus do the work at the wedding? Because he cares about the small things in our lives. Why did God heal the blind man? Because he didn't want the guy to be blind. He wanted to bless him. Why did the guy that was lame walk again? Because God had the power to do that and make him whole. There is, I'm not speaking for God. I can't do that. But the things that's in your life that could destroy your life this morning, God wants to heal you of it. I can say that. God wants to heal you of the sin and the things. Your your family, your friends, your mom, your dad, your children, whoever it is, and they claim to be a born-again believer in Christ, but yet they cannot consistently live that life, you keep on patterning your life after that right there, and you're going to end up just like them. And your children's going to pray and think the same thing that you did. You see, the whole point of the miracle is to stop the way everybody was thinking back then. They thought everything was guided by Pharisees and everything was guided by Romans and everything was guided by rules and regulations. And guess what? Mercy and grace stepped in the picture. Mercy did something for you when you don't deserve it. And he did it. And you know how powerful mercy is? Mercy is so powerful that it is not considered because of what we've done. It's considered because of who God is. He just says, I just give mercy. Now, 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 you see the power of compassion. I want you to know that a truly saved person will always respect and appreciate the person who brings the good news to him. This is something we need to hear today. I leave, I've seen people, and I'm just going to say this, and I know it's being recorded, and somebody's going to hear this message, and I've led you to Jesus. But why is it that somebody who brings the gospel to you, you pray to receive Christ, but yet when that person comes to you, you can't face them? What happens is, that comes to Matthew 13. I'm telling you from my personal experience. The person that brings the gospel to you, you will claim Romans 10, 15. Anybody know that scripture? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. That you will, they, they may mess up. They may do something wrong. You will, you will never forget the day that they were obedient and brought the gospel to you. You will never forget the preacher who preached the message you were saved. You will never forget the mom that prayed for you and told you about Jesus. You will never forget the dad. You will never forget those people. You will never say, I wish I would have never met them. You will never say that in your life when you have genuine, real, pure blood-bought salvation in your life because you know your life truly began that day. You see, and this is what's happening at this time. Jesus and His compassion, He is moved. He did this. He didn't do. He knew the hearts of this man. He knew the hearts of this child. He knew the hearts of the people. But if God only done things based on the good hearts, He never would have went to Calvary. He never would have went to the cross. He never would. It was by, even while I was still a wretched sinner, He died for me. He did it because of who he was. Friend, that is the miracle that we see. What is the difference between what Jesus did for the nobleman, son, and what God did for us? What's the difference? Is, it, is our salvation not as powerful, if not more powerful, of a miracle? Is your salvation a miracle or is it something, well, I'm glad I got that done. I can live any way I want to. I'm glad I've got that done. I can just not pay attention in the service and do whatever I want to, and I'm still going to heaven. No, you're not. Man, when God gets a hold of your life, you don't have to hold the Word of God to fill Him. He is inside of you. And when He's inside of you, that miracle burns. It's like a candle that's lit. And that candle, you can almost feel while the message is being preached, the wax just running down from that thing that is burning. And God is just taking the, 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 the pure impurities from our life and revealing it to us. And He wants to skim the dross off the top, like those people that melt metal and melt aluminum. And they'll take that dross, and it gets hot, and it rises to the top. And every Sunday I come to church, God just takes and said, I know what I can do with that right there. I already did it. He just sort of puts it to the side. And then when we leave here, it's like you can look at yourself in the mirror 
Don't the book of James talk about that? And you can see a completely new image. I might have walked in this place feeling like I was somebody worthless. But because of the Spirit of God in this place, I can leave here being victorious. And, and, and feeling that. Now watch. Here, he, Jesus loved this man's son more than he did. I said this in the first service, and I'm going to say it exactly the same in the second. Moms and dads, you better be careful about interfering with your children where the will of God can't get where they need to be. You need to, moms, you need to let your babies go. You hold your children so tight, well, my child's never going to serve in the mission field. No, you're right, they will. I don't want God to have to take their mama to do it, though. Parents today, you can't love your children like God can. And you certainly can't as a lost person. You're going to destroy your children's life as a lost person if you haven't already. When you look at the Ten Commandments and you look at the Second Commandment and the Third Commandment, one of them says that that sin of the mother and father goes to the second generation, the third generation, and the fourth generation because of the sin that goes. Don't blame God for what's happening to your children. You're the one that said in service and God through the power of the Holy Spirit tried to convict you, but you would not repent. Give your children to God. God loves your children a hundred thousand times more than you can even comprehend. And you know who I'm really talking to? I'm talking to that mom and she's pregnant. And she has that sweet child inside of her. God loves her child a hundred thousand times more than she loves that baby. We can't even comprehend that this morning. We try to make decisions for our children. We're trying to do this. We're trying to go to God. God, would you heal my child? Would you heal my child? God wants this father to see what true healing is. It's not the fact that he needs to travel. God can do whatever God needs to do. God can, t God can be in heaven right now, and in a second, he can say whatever he needs to say, and it can happen and give life to anybody in this service right now. Now, now Jesus loves this man's son more than he did, and, and, and if, if I can only get Jesus to my son, he, he will do even more than I could possibly imagine for him. That's the thought that we need to have this morning. If I can only get Je if, Jesus, if I, can, if, if, you, if I need to see the kingdom of God, I need to know how to pray, I need to model this in front of my children, what it means to be a believer, what it means to worship, what it means to experience the miracle of salvation. Model this in front of your children over and over and over. Because honestly, if I was to tell you the truth, when I was 12, I, I, I supposedly prayed, but my life never did look like Granny's. My life never did. I never prayed like her. I never, I never sang like her. I never worshiped like her. I never talked like her. I, I didn't have the same qualities that the Holy Spirit had put in her life. Well, did she receive a different Holy Spirit than what I did? Ah, oh, it's the same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to worship in, 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 in Brother Steve Fain the same way the Holy Spirit's going to worship in me. And the Holy Spirit's going to worship in Barry the same way that the Holy Spirit is going to worship in Brad. And, and it, it just continue. It goes on. The Holy Spirit is in this room and He invades your body. He is going to have the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. That's what He does. Unless we interfere. When we begin to interfere, we begin to confuse our children. And we begin to confuse. And that's why, listen, you know, on tonight we're doing hymns. And, and it, 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 I am convinced, and I will say this with the authority of Jesus. If churches that sang hymns would live those hymns, you would never read of a dying church. Never. The hymn that we're going to look at tonight... 20,000 people that they could come up with, that they could kind of keep a total. 20,000 people is how many people this person led the Lord. We got people singing the hymns. They think it, they have a right to not share the gospel. Churches are just going to die. Why else would God have us to have a body if we're not going to share the greatest story that's ever been told. And can I tell you something? You're part of that story. 
This is the beginning. God's still writing the pages. And the book that we're concentrating on this morning starts right here, but it ends in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's still adding names every day to that book. People who have experienced, every name in that book's a miracle. Every miracle in that book, only God performed it. The power of the command. The command traveled 15 to 20 miles at the very second it happened. Now, why did this happen in verse 50 through 53? And Jesus said to him, go your way and your son live. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, which means he believed the man kept his word. And, and, and as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. And then all of a sudden, he changes his, his, his thought process. And now, why, what time did this happen? Because it's almost like he'd heard these stories. I want to see proof for myself. I'm going to find out, what time did he say this? It was at this time. And then when he said, he said, he knew exactly. He said, man, he just spoke the word. He just spoke it, and it happened. I'm going to tell you something. Is it possible for God to take a lost person that's in this service right now and speak life into you in this invitation? Absolutely. Is it possible for God to remove some things in your life? Absolutely. He can do it. He can do anything that he wants to do. The word of God was to show the nobleman that you can trust the word of God. If you ever experience this miracle of salvation, man, you're, you're going to believe God at His word for everything else He has. Why? Because not only do you have His word, but He has stamped His seal of approval on you. You have been sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is going to convince, going to rebuke, going to teach, going to pray for you when you don't know how to pray. It just takes over your life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It says that the work of God in this was to show the nobleman that God is not bound by or limited by distance and space. God can do anything he wants to do anytime he wants to. He can't. You, I, I have the power to pray in Jesus' name. And when I pray, I always pray in Jesus' name. I, I watch these movies sometimes, these Christian movies, and they say, uh, they finish praying, they just say amen. Friend, you don't have a prayer unless it's in Jesus' name. When you pray, you in that prayer in Jesus' name. So that's legalistic. No, it's not. It's scripture. You pray in Jesus' name. If it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't even be able to pray. That he is the mediator between man and God, Christ Jesus. And we have that ability and that, and that, and that victory. Do you realize victory is in you, is in you this morning? That there are people that the Holy Spirit is going to bring to remembrance. How many you remember reading that text in John? That the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance. What all is he bringing to remembrance? The Holy Spirit is going to convict you of sin, but also he's going to put people on your mind. He's going to cause you to have a burden for other people. And now, now what are you going to do with that? Let's just say some, God puts a burden on you for somebody, and they don't know they have cancer yet, and you don't know they have cancer yet. God just put a burden for you for that person. You just go on and don't respond during the invitation. You just go on home. How dangerous do you think that is? How many times does God protect our family through the week and we don't even know it? Do you realize that we sit in this building serving the God of miracles? And you are one. You are a channel by which God wants to use to bless other people. And you are a channel by which God wants to use to reach other people. We would never have a spiritual problem in being obedient to the Great Commission if everybody would just do one thing. Everybody in this church and any church that exists would get so involved in the Word of God that you lead your family, yourself, to Jesus. We would never have to worry about the Great Commission. See, the problem is, is we get where we're not fascinated with a miracle anymore. Mostly because it hasn't genuinely happened in many people. But when it has happened in people, you can become too overwhelmed by the burden of it. 
Because you see so many, well, what do I say? What do I do? Why can't they see, God? Why can't they get it? Can you imagine being a pastor today and watching all the church-isms and the, and the people? They keep coming out with these programs in church life. And every program does everything except embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has it in there because they have to do it so they're guilt complex. But the problem is, is the people that's writing our material are not serving in the local church in such a way that they're leading people to Jesus because they can't ask people to do what they're not doing. I don't want to become one of those people. I want to be fascinated by the Word of God. I want to be fascinated by the work of God because I've experienced it, not because I told you about it. And I want to see, just like him, the wisdom of God was to show the nobleman that even though God had a plan, Jesus was a better, had a better one. See, here's the power of Christ in this. They thought the miracle was the son's life, but it wasn't. It was the family's salvation. That was the goal. God, Jesus is shooting for your family. Dad, you come and you get saved. Jesus is shooting for your family. He said, now he's, he's glad to have you, but he, you're the tool he wants to use to get it. Most families are in the pits today because they have a dad that will not worship God. Most families, most families in our community, most families in our county, most families in our state, everything goes back to dad. Dad will not read the Bible. Dad will not pray with the family. Dad will not hide thine word in thine heart that I might not sin against thee. Dad will not do Dad will not. Dad will not. Listen, Dad, when you get a hold of it, and then you're going to find out, listen, God honored what Dad did. Man, God honored this. You know what happened? It wasn't long. Miracles. Miracles just start. Barry said it very well. Miracles just start popping up everywhere. The goal wasn't Dad. The goal was the house. That's exactly what it is. He wants, he, it's just, it's, yeah, whoo, yeah, <laughs> yes. And he himself believed in his whole household. You will never, ever, forget, re, never regret trusting Jesus. Man, when I came to jail, I'll never, I never regret that. And sometimes God challenges me. When has God challenged me? Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday I have to get up and do something that's not in my personality to do it. I don't like standing up in front of people. I don't like talking. I know that's hard to believe. But if my wife could tell you who I used to be, I did not like being the center of attention. I still don't. But when God gives you something that burns in your heart, you cannot keep it in. You cannot keep it in. It's got to come out or you feel like you're just going to spiritually bust. And that's what God's doing now, man. I love this. The miracle did not save the family. Jesus did. You see, I, talk, I, go, I go and visit ICU, and if I, could t- if I had a dollar for every time I've heard this, and there are people, there, there are hundreds and hundreds of people within 10 miles of this church who have the same testimony, and I cannot share or say something in any way right But God did something amazing, brought them back to life, healed them of this disease, healed them of that disease, did this. And never one time can they tell me a day that they heard the gospel, that they surrendered their life to Jesus, that they repented of their sin. And here's the answer I get from everybody. How do you know that you saved? How do you know that you pray? Well, Brother Joey, I pray and ask God to forgive me every day. Friend, that's not salvation. You need a priest. There's only one Holy Father, and it is not the Pope. No man should ever be called Holy Father. Holy Father, there is one, and His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And when you call on Him, you have power in His name. And that power can redeem you, save you, set you free, cut you loose, do something in your life that you cannot do yourself and then what we have today this traditionalism and this mess that we get in with religion and we're thinking another man has a closer connection to God than I can absolutely not you have the same rights to the blood of Jesus as I have we have different purposes and different callings but we have the same relationship you see that's the miracle 
You are just as empowered. You are just as powerful in Jesus' name as the man standing behind the pulpit this morning. You have the same freedom in Christ that everybody else has. You have the same rights to relationship as Billy Graham, as Billy Sunday, as, as all of these great saints that you've seen has been so faithful. Listen, if you are not living that standard, it is because you're living more for sin than you are Jesus. This morning, you ask yourself, if I have that responsibility, that is mine, that means I need to respect the miracle. I need to honor and love the miracle that God's did in my life. And you have to ask yourself the question, so why am I here? Did I come to church because it's what everybody does? Or did I come to church because of what Jesus has already done? I'm here to worship Jesus this morning because of who he is. He's Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah God. He is my provider. He's my redeemer. And the same God that works in me works in you the same exact way. That's why Paul wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. He was letting the people know, if you have a relationship with the same Jesus I met on Damascus Road, me or you one have a problem. Because God doesn't perform a miracle here one way of salvation and a miracle over here. God saves us and redeems us all for one purpose. To bring us to himself and to send us out. Each and every one of us. I pray this morning in this second service, just like the first service. Is your salvation a miracle? When you look at your life, are you so amazed by what Jesus has done that there's not another miracle that compares to it? And maybe there's somebody here this morning and the gospel has been planted in your life It just don't have no roots in your life yet. That means you haven't surrendered your heart and life to Jesus. I'm going to read this text. Barry, if you would, you come on up. And I'm going to read to you Matthew 13, 19. This is one of the most powerful texts about the parable of the sower. Because these, when we say we're saved and we start walking away from things and leaving things and not having victory in our life no more... According to this text right here, you didn't ever have it to begin with. Because God says that we will endure to the end. We will finish our race. We will will have strong faith. Not that we won't struggle, but we will have victory. Victory is not something I'm trying to attain. Victory is something by faith I already have. God don't have to fix my family for me to have to have victory. God doesn't have to do any more miracles for me to have victory. He's already done those things. If I need God to do something else to convince me that he's done something, then I've missed the very first thing that he did. And that was the blood that he shed on Calvary. I believe every house of church members who don't or cannot consistent and don't come anymore, I think we need to have a team visit them and set them down, read this text to them, and ask them what soil they're in. There's four souls. You can't argue with this. Ever how you're living will prove where you are. When anyone hears the word of God of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. This is the person who comes to church, hears it, ah, big deal. You just go on, didn't affect you whatsoever. I would have rather been texting. I would have rather been at Six Flags. I would have rather been doing something else. That's that soul. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he who has no root in himself but endures only for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles, which means he did not finish his race. He did not endure to the end. Came to the church for about a month, 
A couple of things happened. The Word of God started confronting tithing, started confronting praying, started confronting conviction in your life that you needed to be serving God, and you just got mad and said, I don't have anything to do with organized religion. That's that soil. Now he who receives the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. This is someone who they were sorry for their sin they just wouldn't surrender to Jesus. The only way you can genuinely be saved is you have to totally surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. But when you do it, truly, it's almost like God has to get us to a place that we have no hope in nothing else. I've tried everything else. Nothing works. Jesus, you're all that's left. Come to find out, he was all there was. I just didn't realize that. But here's the only one that's saved. This is the only one that's saved in this text. This is what people need to hear today. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, sixty, and thirty times. Why? Because the power of salvation is the power of the seed. When God saved you, he placed himself inside of you. That's what made you feel forgiven. That's what made you feel redeemed. And God calls you to fall in love with a bunch of imperfect people who are all broken inside. And God's just trying to put all the pieces back together again. The only good soul is that one. Which one of those souls are you? What's the fruit that you're bearing? Who are the people that's coming to the kingdom of God because of you? Who are the people who are not in the kingdom today because of you? They can say, man, that's an invitation song right there, Conway Twitty. My goodness. I'm trying to remember the name of that so I can use that somehow. That's so good. I can't answer for y'all. When we was in this first service, I shared with the church how my wife and I have a relationship. Our relationship's not perfect, but it's good. When we're married, God made us one. But we became one through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God keeps us one. Sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes we agree on things. Most of the time we do. Most of the time we agree on things. Sometimes we'll have a disagreement. Sometimes she gets on my nerves. A lot of the times I get on her nerves. Okay? It happens. Nothing she's ever done causes me to love her less. That's why God wants that relationship to be with us in the body of Christ as a church family. We become one through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's one faith, one baptism, one Lord that's in us all, through us all, and for us all. We're the bride of Christ. We're supposed to love each other regardless of what we find out about each other or what we don't know about each other or how we feel about each other. None of those things, nothing should separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But we're supposed, in the body of Christ is a supernatural thing. But friend, you've got to be truly redeemed. As long as you are not truly surrendered to Jesus, you're going to feel like a third leg and you're not going to feel right. All I want to do is tell you this. God created you to perform a miracle in you. He is not willing that any should perish. And I want you to know the things that you're struggling with in your life this morning. You struggle with it because of you. Not because of God. If you were to die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? And the next thing I want to ask you is this. Do you want to go to heaven? Then ask God, test me and see if there's any wicked way in me.
Let's let the body of Christ be the body of Christ. If we all become one the way we're supposed to, just like in our marriage, God will do a miracle. I watched it this morning. I watched one baby come up and sit beside daddy. I watched another baby come up and sit beside daddy. And then I watched that little baby out of that nursery come and sit and come up beside daddy. Then I watched that little baby take mama because it wanted to go pray. Sometimes we get overwhelmed, so overwhelmed by the miracle, we forget to thank God for the miracle. Hey guys, I'm the pastor of Union 3. My name is Joey Hanner, and uh, we are so thankful that you've been able to listen to the message today. But I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. And today, when we think about salvation, uh, I was one of those church members, one of those people that said I prayed when I was younger, and uh, but my life did not change. When you when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your life will change. God has a plan for your life. You see, He created you for heaven, but you can't earn or deserve that because heaven is a perfect place. And God says, I'm not going to let one sin into heaven. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we think about sin, we think about murder, we think about stealing. But the sin is what we think is, is our thought life. And we are just sinful by nature. And, but Jesus came where it doesn't have to be that way. God loves us. He said, I'll solve that problem. I'm going to send my son Jesus. He sent his son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have one everlasting life. You see, God came to give you life. And he wants us to be more than a church member. He wants us to be more than someone that prayed a prayer, said a decision. Praying a prayer is the greatest power there is because that is our tool and the instrument God give us to repent. He said if you'll repent, he said times of refreshing will come in your life. You see, in our life, God looks at us, but he can't see, he can see us. We can't have a relationship with him because this sin separates us from God. And we take and we have intellectual, we know that God exists we have intellectual faith but we just believe that he's there but we don't really have a relationship with him uh, we have temporal faith temporal faith is well god i tell you what if you'll fix this in my life i'll turn my life around well, where does my sin go it doesn't go anywhere well god i tell you what if you'll do this in my life i promise you i'll turn over a new leaf It'll go for a little while, and it'll just, we'll go right back into the same old, same old. Why? Because we think we can change ourselves. Friend, you can't change yourself. If you could, you would have already done it. Only thing that can change your life is by God's grace. He came into this world so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's why the scripture says, all like sheep have gone astray, each into his own way. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, he takes his sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And there's one mediator. His name is Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that. It also teaches in first, or in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So can you go to a time in your life that you trusted Jesus. If you never have, you can do it by just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and be my Savior. I am trusting you today to save me. And you will be my Lord and be my Savior. If you've done that today, we're proud of you. And we'd love to hear from you here at Union 3. Go to u3bchurch.com. Or just call the church office and let someone know, 256-494-9180. We would love to hear from you. And thank you again for watching here at Union 3 Baptist Church. We love you, and we have a great big old life.